have with us uh, Jack Williamson this afternoon, uh, and I'm Rusty Hevelin. We're talking at the uh, Convention Center in Orlando, Florida at the 50th uh, World Science Fiction Convention called Magicon, and I'm going to talk a little bit with Jack Williamson about his history and maybe dig a little into things that have not been widely written or taped up before. Uh, you have, Jack, been uh, so, I guess, widely publicized at one time or another. You've been a guest at so, so many conventions. You've been interviewed uh, <laughs> so many times that some of these questions may be almost to the point of boredom. Uh, in fact, uh, before I uh, <laughs> came over here, I was said, told uh, by one person, be sure and ask him about the covered wagon story, which of course you've written up and uh, told before, uh, and maybe we'll get to that. But uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the early years, and if you want to get into the covered wagon story, that's all right, but uh, the, the early years uh, and how you feel that those early years may have led into your career. Uh, whether it was an escape from uh, the non-scientific and non-educational kind of a background uh, or whatever. Well, I think there was a, a good deal of escape. We, I lived my first th three years on an isolated farm, a uh, ranch in the Sierra Madre of Northern New Mexico where th there was almost nobody else. We moved when I was three to an irrigated farm near Pecos, Texas, where we had no very near neighbors, and then to a homestead in eastern New Mexico where there were no near neighbors. I was the oldest kid, and I was had no, no peers. My, my, I had my my younger siblings, and I knew no other young people until I started the school when I was in the fourth grade. And I lived very largely in my own imagination, and, and to a great, great extent, I still do. And I have simply learned how to write the imaginings into stories that I can sell. Sounds like you might have developed into a real science fiction fan. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was a science fiction fan when I discovered science fiction. At that time, I had very little science fiction available. I came across the Poe's Tales of Imagination and I read, read Bulwer Lutton's The Coming Race. It was a great adventure when I was loaned a copy of Mark Twain's Connecticut Yankee, but generally I was pretty much on my own. Uh, my parents had both been teachers. They provided a good deal of reading material of the sort that was available to subscribe to the Saturday Evening Post and magazines like Scribner's and Harper's when they could. My mother read a good deal aloud to us, but this wasn't science fiction. And when I but it was reading. Uh, you're good at this. You you just took one of my questions right away from me and fielded it beautifully. Uh, parents can be so important. Uh, uh, your home environment can be so important uh, as far as how you develop uh, in the whole business of uh, education, reading, communications, and the whole work. Uh, as teachers, uh, did they do some of these things deliberately, or uh, was it just always there and uh, by well, absorption? It, of course, they, they were teaching me at home. I don't don't remember the details, but I, I did, did learn to read. My education in math was n nearly non-existent, but. So certainly, reading was encouraged, and 
material of a sort was available, as, such as they could afford. And, well, so, somebody gave us a copy of the, the, the Red Fire book, which I read and reread, and there were other books that came along from from here and there. I can't think of all the titles. The Blue Fairy book, <laughs> at any rate. Um, a lot of science fiction fans and, and numerous uh, writers as well really got their uh, what they think of as their start in the fairy tales and uh, the Mother Goose things and uh, you know Billy, Gro mm -hmm. Billy Goat Gruff and and so forth. Uh, this was pretty much the case in your beginnings. I think so. Mm -hmm. uh, when when you uh, discovered the magazines, had you at that time read much in the uh, adventure and science fiction area? Uh, pra practically none. There was no none available. I had a grandmother who gave me subscriptions to things like the, the Youth's Companion and the American Boy, and occasionally they had science fiction type stories, like uh, there was a, a, sto a story that involved the discovery of a, an encounter with a dinosaur by J. Allen Dunn. I can't think of the title of it. And, well, adventure stories that appealed to me when I read them. You were and they signed it. The American boy had a contest what once for I can't remember the details of the contest <coughs> but they involved writing an ending for a problem or something and I submitted something that won an honorable mention and then a few years later it became the basis for my novel, The Green Girl. Really? Yeah, a st story of inverted gravity ca causing an inhabitable ca cavity at the bottom of the ocean. Mm -hmm. And this this was one of those things where they, they told part of the story and then asked, how does it end? Yeah, I don't remember the details mm -hmm. of the story. But well, you mentioned The American Boy. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, which was a little bit after you, but not all that much. Uh, there was a series of stories that were outright science fiction adventure stories in The American Boy, written by Carl H. Claudy. Did you happen to ever read any of those? No, that, that was after my time, I guess. The name science fiction hadn't been invented That's then, right. And, and there was very little of that sort of fiction at all. It was a, a sort of lucky accident. Of course, Argosy and other parts were publishing Edgar Rice Burroughs and, and whatever, and, and I accidentally got to read a copy of Tarzan of the Apes, but Bur Burroughs was otherwise out of my experience. Mm -hmm. I discovered him in amazing stories with the that made an storm of the land that time forgot, which was a great adventure. Mm -hmm. And then the mastermind of Mars in the Amazing Stories Annual. When you, by the time you got into and through high school, uh, how much access did you have to public library? None. None. We, we, we lived 35 miles from the county seat, which mm -hmm may or may not have had a public library, I don't know, but to get there, you, you tra traveled all day in a wagon and spent the night in the wagon yard and shopped and went home on the third day. And yeah. If there's a library there, I knew nothing about it. Mm -hmm. I attended rural schools where they had a scattering of a shelf of books they called a library, I guess. And I came across let me see coming race on one of those and, and another adventure story in which I've forgotten the name and the author that had a, a, a sort of 
suspense type ending that might have been classified as science fiction, but generally I didn't even know that 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 sort of fiction existed. And, uh, uh, read, read Connecticut Yankee, for example, and mm. Poe gave me some animations of it. But. Well, this this is interesting that you had this little exposure, and yet you uh, you found your niche in the science fiction thing at a pretty early age. Well, uh, well it was just d discovering amazing stories. And, that opened up a new world, and of course, Grinsback was re reprinting the best of the existing science fiction, and, and I re read that avidly, lived the stories, and tried to write my own. How many did? Uh, I think we all know the story of <laughs> of, of your. Uh, first publication appearing on the stands and you're discovering it yeah. before you even knew that it had been it purchased. Quite a thrill. <laughs> uh, uh, how many stories did you write before that story was bought? I don't know. I, I, I wrote various things that never got finished. The first time I tried to write a novel, the title was the Prince of Atlantis, and I wrote a page and a half and ran, ran out of material, and I worked on two or three things that never got finished, and then wrote a number of stories I sent to Guns back, that came back with rejection slips. I, I don't know mm. how many, maybe, maybe a dozen, I just Maybe a dozen, yeah. You know, I, well. Most of them probably still exist. I, I saved them in the, in the envelopes in which they came back and gave them to our library, and I suppose they still have them. That's interesting because uh, I know in, in my own experience uh, talking with writers from the pulp era, uh, so many of them didn't keep track of anything. They, they can't tell you and they don't remember uh, the stories in many instances. Uh, uh, some have done as you have, they just kept every scrap of paper and I think this is such a wonderful thing because somewhere down the pike uh, this is going to be history. Well, it's history now, but it's uh, it's going to be... Whether well, anybody's ever going to be interested is another question. Well, Jack, you, you know that uh, they're going to be interested because uh, you're committed. All your stuff is going to uh, the university, isn't it? Yes. And it's, most of it is already there. Right. Would you would you talk a little bit about that? We'll just jump ahead. Uh, well, we had a li librarian at Eastern who well, was interested in my work and whatever. Oh, and I can't, can't think of his name. And he, I do donated my working papers in the library I had, which was the beginning of the science fiction collection. At, Eastern, and it has been added to with the papers of, of Lee Brackett and Ed Hamilton and v various uh, other sorts of materials. To, it's one of the few larger university collections. I don't know how it would rank. It's, they've cl claimed it was in the top four or five. I'm not su sure it is, but in the top dozen or two, I imagine. I think they have something like 10,000 volumes and rut runs of most of the ma magazines. And, and kind of nice. They gave them 20 years of edited, mm. copy edited manuscripts from the analog files. And mm. they, and Don Wilhelm gave them a complete collection of, of his books. I, I guess his, his, his current dog collection, I'm mm -hmm. sure, around 800 titles in that run, and so on and so forth. Well, they keep well, adding to it. Yeah. Let us let us hope that they can keep somebody in a position there who
continues to be interested in it, so well, it'll be taken care of. I think, well, up to now, our, our librarian at Dallin came there partly because he's interested in science fiction. That's great. And he's committed to it, and the people who are in charge of the, the collection are also dedicated. Mary Jo Walker is just retiring, but they have other people taking a place who are just as dedicated, I think. Uh, you've done this before, but uh, I'd like to have uh, some immediate uh, concept of how you felt when you saw this cover picture of your story on the newsstands. Well, it, it was a thrill, let's say. I'd been buying groceries. I was light housekeeping with my sister at Canyon, Texas, attending what was then the West Texas State Teachers College, and I bought a little bag of groceries, and there were three copies of the magazine on the stand. I bought all of them and left my groceries, <laughs> and I had visions of, of wealth from the publication. I imagined I would get hundreds of dollars the story eventually got 25. And it was the, the bug that bit me. I kept on writing. I was in my freshman year, and by the end of two years, I was selling enough st stories to, to well, pay my way through school. I was offered a student assistantship in chemistry. I set out to major in chemistry, but mm -hmm. I dro dropped out of school to write science fiction. Well, now that, I have never known until now that, that you had gone that deeply into chemistry. It's obvious from your I work. I had two years of chemistry and physics and mm -hmm. math, and was doing well enough to go on, and my life might have been better if I'd Studies <laughs> after degrees, probably become a petroleum geologist, and mm. might have made more money and written less science fiction. That would have been our loss, and I, I certainly mean that. Uh, there are a few of you now who, like yourself and uh, uh, Sprague de Camp, who has have almost, you might say, spanned the life of magazine science fiction because although Gernsback came in in 26 you were so close behind him uh, from this perspective it looks like you've been here forever and the longer the better uh, have you uh, ever along the way uh, gone back and, and looked over your career and uh, looked at things that you felt were peaks and valleys and if so uh, what were they? What were the high points and, and the low points? Well, of course, I, I looked back when I was writing Wonder's Child, my autobiography, and after a, a few years, well, I w wasn't getting rich, and I became a sort of disillusioned with my, my life and the field in general. I, I wasn't very well adjusted socially. I, after I dro dropped out of Canyon, I, I went after a year to the, to the University of New Mexico and enrolled as a psychology major on the theory that psychology would give me a better basis in, in characterization. And, mm -hmm. Got, got acquainted with the theories of Freud and, and arranged to, to go, go under psychoanalysis, mm -hmm. which was a, a good thing to do. I went to the men of the clinic at Topeka and wound up sp spending three hours a week with Dr. Charles W. Ted, who was a humane psychologist mm -hmm. uh, was very, very good for me, I think. I spent a year with him there until I ran out of money in progress and 
dropped out, and then a couple of years later, after we moved to Beverly Hills, I went back to, went to California, and he let, let me come in two, two hours a week for another year. And I, it, I can't say that it made me over, but it taught me more about what I am and to accept myself as I am. And generally, it was a part of a general process of growing up and learning to accept, to accept myself and become a member of the human race. And so I'm grateful to Dr. Ted and feel it was a good experience. Recommend it to anyone, huh? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you mentioned Beverly Hills. Uh, how long did you live in California? Oh, so, something like a year. Mm -hmm. A little over, probably. Mm -hmm. I, they, we discontinued the analysis I, after a year, and I, I came home to New Mexico, but I was back there again when the, the Pearl Harbor happened. I heard, heard it all radio and phone Bob Hanlon with the news and came back to New Mexico then and wrote there until I entered the service. Dr. Ted arranged the deferment for me, but my brother was in the service and I decided that I ought to be and I volunteered to, to be drafted, let's say. And the, Army was another good experience for me. I was an Air Force's meteorologist, was a weather forecaster. It was an interesting science. I learned more about adjusting to human beings. I was moved frequently from one station to another, finally to the Southwest Pacific, and discovered that a few hours after I was with a new group of men, I had new friends, and, and generally it was easier to get adjusted to military life than it was to get readjusted to civilian life after I got out of there. Mm, yeah. Well, there's, there's a routine. I was also a weather forecaster in the Pacific uh, during that period, and as far as I know, you and Fred Pohl and I are the only weather forecasters still extant from <laughs> that period in the science fiction yeah. field. Uh, how how uh, useful was your experience and your memories of uh, the military uh, in your later career as a writer? Well, it's impossible to sort out specific influences. Everything you know becomes part of yourself and part of the machinery you use in, in writing the story, mm -hmm. so, so I've very seldom drawn on it in any specific conscious way, but I'm sure that it influences my attitudes, my perceptions, my awareness of human beings and human behavior and so forth, so that I think that Everything you do is useful. Mm -hmm. I've traveled extensively yeah. since, and the impressions I have of different lands and cultures and people and so forth. Occasionally I use deliberately as, as story material, but even if it isn't deliberate, why well, it's part of the. Well, the. The ammunition, let's say, that's available when I need to, to create a scene or a character or whatever. Right. Storage bin. <laughs> uh, in, along that track, uh, sure, it's all there uh, to for later use. Uh, have you found that uh, because of your travels and this, these various experiences, have you found a lot of them popping into your stories early on? Uh, do you find that if you've been somewhere and experienced uh, something new that it appears very soon after in your work, or is it something that's just lurking back there and comes out later on? Well, probably some, some of both. When I was working on my, my 
the story of May's Way, for example, I came across some Buddhist carvings of dra dragons at da Dazu, at about 60 miles out of Chongqing, which d d gave me a v villain for the story. Mm -hmm. That sort of thing d doesn't often happen. Mm -hmm. All, all you know is it's useful, and, and you, I don't often, almost never try, try to, to draw, draw on specific people as character sources or put particular places into a story. But when you're trying to imagine someone, why the ideas, the images come, and I, I depend to a great extent on an input from the unconscious. I, I have a problem and don't worry if I don't know the solution immediately because when I need it a few years later, well, it will be there. Mm -hmm. It co comes to your mind in a process you're not entirely conscious of, but it uses the materials you have available that are accumulated in a lifetime. And it's impossible to separate them at all. What comes from where? They're just there and available, and they turn up often disguised, so you, you wouldn't know the, the source. Mm. Uh, I've been lucky enough, uh, I really consider it good luck in my life to uh, uh, have been able to talk to you know, a good many science fiction writers, and I know that. Uh, Everybody works in different ways, and they set up different kinds of situations for working. Uh, Clifford Simic, for example, worked off the kitchen table uh, for a good deal of uh, his early career. Uh, and I know that, for example, that Joe Haldeman gets up in the middle of the night to do his writing. Uh, can you touch a little on your particular uh, uh, approach to writing in, in terms of the physical environment and uh, your timing and things of that well, sort? I have a room I'm built, designed myself as a sort of dining workshop. I have a computer there and, and the working library that I need that I have room for and I have b breakfast and, and Usually take a nap after breakfast, get, get up around you know, 5 30 or something, take a walk, eat breakfast, and a nap, and, and turn the computer on about 8 o'clock and wait for an hour or so and stop and get the mail and, and have a cup of coffee and wait another hour or so, have lunch and another nap and then another hour or so of work and then some exercise or a nap and another stint usually and I can type faster than I can think so that when I'm working on a story why it sort of fills my mind all the time I'm awake mm -hmm. and I can solve problems, images come to me, I sometimes organize paragraphs in my mind before, when I'm away from the scene, type it when I come back. And I leave the same chapter in the computer for several days till it's done and revise it ordinarily, tickle with it every time I turn the computer on again. And then print, print it out ch chapter by chapter. When it's done, I like to keep a hard copy, just a sort of security blanket, mm, yeah. as well as keeping two different copies on floppy disks. Well, that certainly is uh, a modern approach for somebody who's been around to uh, quote from the beginning. But uh, uh, have you developed this particular kind of a daytime schedule mostly since the computer came in, or was this something you've used for quite well, a long time? I, I, I used to have more energy. I, I 
in my early writing, well, about the time I published my first story, I acquired a, a, a portable typewriter that I wrote on for many years, and I was able in those early days to write steadily for hours at a time. When I was writing my novel, Legion of Space, for example, it was long summer days, and I wrote a chapter in the morning and a chapter in the mm -hmm. afternoon. My ideal in those days was, was Frederick Faust, Max Brown, who wrote 4,000 words a day and submitted them in first draft mm -hmm. under 20 odd different names. And, and I followed that system for years. And, and I didn't sell everything I wrote, and there were days when production wasn't all that good, but there were times when, when it worked, when I could write 8,000 words in two days and sell it to Strange Tales for two cents a word, which was fa fabulous pay for a farm kid <laughs> in the middle of the Depression. <laughs> Peyton, of course, went bankrupt, and, and astounding was later on the street and Smith paying one side of work instead of two. I sold some material for as little as half a side of work, so mm. you had to turn out a lot of copy if you hoped to make any sort of living out of it. And nowadays, I don't have to write something I don't really want to write just in the hope of making money out of it. Yeah. I don't have the energy to, to sp spend the typewriter so many hours a day. And nowadays, if I have a, a problem of any sort so that I can't write the next se sentence instead of sitting there and fr fretting over it while I get up and go away, and, mm -hmm. and when I come back, and know how to go, go on with it. What, uh, uh, you've got a long time to think about here, but uh, uh, what are the real highlights, uh, the, the fun times, the uh, most enjoyable experiences you think you had, either directly in your career or as a result of it? You've mentioned travel and so forth, so sort of anywhere. Well, when a story is go going right, I'm living it. It's a real experience. The characters in it are more real than most of the people I know. I enjoy working on it. And, and it's a real, real high in doing the actual work. To, after the story is finished and sent off, is a sort of letdown because you miss it. I'm happy when I have a story going and I am when I don't. And of course, there's a, there's a high when anybody likes a story and buys it. And when I see the magazine or the, or the book. And, but my life is generally been well rewarding in many ways. I feel I've been lucky. I generally spent most of my life doing what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. what I enjoyed to do, which is true of most people. But when I went back to school to get my degrees, where I enjoyed the graduate work, reading great literature and talking about it with, with scholars. I enjoyed my, my teaching. I taught for well, close to 20 years altogether. Of course, a lot of that was drudgery, but I, I liked the yeah, students. I enjoyed my colleagues. I was permitted to teach a wide variety of courses ranging from freshman English to creative writing, linguistics, literary criticism, and writers like James Joyce and Hemingway and Faulkner and the Russian novelists. So it was very enjoyable. I 
hated to quit, and I, I still teach a course every spring. And, and of course, tra traveling is rewarding. Uh, uh, in, in my marriage to Blanche was something that worked out very well, it changed our life in many ways. And we had 37 good years together. But since her death, I've made a better readjustment than I ever expected to do. And in spite of the years and whatever, I generally enjoy the life day by day as it goes along. And I'm happy to have a story going and another story in prospect. It's I can look back over a pretty satisfying or fortunate life. See, I, I said you were very good because you just took another of my questions. I was going to ask about the rewards of your marriage, and you got to, you beat me to the points there, which is great. Uh, how did your career affect your marriage with Blanche? Uh, well, how did she feel about it? She, she wasn't a science fiction fan, but she, she was so, so supportive. She n never tried to get me to quit, quit writing and do, do anything else. Mm -hmm. she, she kept us alive when necessary when I was spending my year in graduate school. Mm -hmm. It was, a, I say, a good partnership between us. Mm -hmm. Was, uh, in terms of partnership, uh, you said she wasn't a fan. Uh, was she at all involved in the work? Uh, no, 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 no. Sometimes there's a very... She, she had a, a children's clothing shop that kept her busy. So she oh, she a, had a little business. She had a career of her own. Mm -hmm. and, so I did, did what I could to help her with that, and she was supportive to what I was trying to do. It was a good partnership. Can you tell us a little bit about your travels? Uh, you've already mentioned the fact that you felt that you got a lot of benefits and pleasures from them. Uh, uh, and here again, I'm sure you've been asked repeatedly about them and have written about some of them. But uh, are there highlights in your travel that you particularly well, treasure? It's, it's hard to pick spe specific things. We live in an interesting world. I've, uh, we first started traveling with a Dr. Carl Parker, who's on faculty at Eastern. We do, do, do month-long trips in those days. I guess traveling was a little less expensive then. It was one of the early trips. We went right around the Pacific. We, we spent a week or so, so in Japan. And when we landed in Tokyo, while our Japanese fans were waiting with red roses for Blanche. <laughs> Ayukawa people gave a banquet for us. We went to Kyoto and met with a science fiction club there. One of the, the club members is st still a friend of mine and s sends me gifts, had me write a letter to read at his wedding and sends me pictures of his kids these days. And we went on to Hong Kong, to th Thailand, to, to Singapore, and Robin Johnson, who's a ta Tasmanian fan, rode all night in, in the train to, to see me there. And he, I saw him again here at this convention. Yes, he's here. And he, Jack Chandler and his wife gave us a, a dinner there. We went from there to New Zealand, which is a beautiful island, and to Tahiti and Fiji. That was a great trip. There were other tri trips equally great. I 
when we first went overseas, we spent 11 weeks beginning with Spain and Egypt and working through Greece and Rome and Switzerland and Munich and down the Rhine and three days in Paris and London and caught a Russian liner from London to to Leningrad with a stop in Helsinki and came back across R R Russia in a bus with a Belgian driver through, through Minsk and Smolensk from, from M Moscow and East G Germany and, and then f four days in Ireland before we came home. That, <laughs> that, that was a, a nice introduction to the world. Yeah, I've been back to R Russia twice. I, been to China three times. Blanche and I spent two weeks in, in Kenya. And all these things are different. Uh, yeah. You're immersed in a different culture. You meet different people. You, you have indelible impressions. We, when we were traveling in Kenya, why? So, some huge elephants came out of a grove of trees to our bus and, and st stopped about 20 yards behind us to drink water out of a rut. We found ourselves in the middle of a pride of lions, about 45 of them, God estimated. It, it, all these things are fa fabulous impressions. You can't say one is better than another. Mm -hmm. They're just different. We, Stonehenge wasn't fenced then. We could w wander th through the, the stones and, and consider the problems and how they got there and what, what they made. Mm -hmm. And I can think of, of an endless variety of things. I walked on top of the Great Wall and have a picture of myself standing there that was taken by a friendly J Japanese tourist. And whatever. Yeah. Uh, I got the impression uh, at a couple of points along there that you've managed to make time to uh, spend time, a little time within the culture uh, rather than just fleeting through some yeah. of these trips. The more time you can spend, the better. Mm -hmm. You, you don't I, I, li I, I like to travel with an organized group because the tour director will say, say to your travel plans and a decent hotel and, and good meals and <laughs> so on and so forth without any troubles and delays and ideally it would doubtless be better to, to spend lo longer and with less planned things. But the, I, went, I went to, to Yugoslavia a few years ago without adequate visas to complete a tour of the Iron Curtain countries. And I had th three days on my own in Sarajevo where I didn't know the language and knew no one who spoke the language. And those were pretty interesting days and I have a, a pa painful sense these days when I see what is happening to Sarajevo. It's, it's interesting to see the news and see things that you recognize and know because you've been there, yeah. which is not common to most people. Uh, I'm talking quite a bit now about you. Let, let's take a sort of a quick span of something that has been covered before, but uh, uh, just get a little bit of a perspective of your viewpoint on your own career. You've mentioned two or three of the stories you've written, uh, The Legion of Space, and uh, early on, your influences, uh, that is, the influences on you, uh, were pretty obvious. Uh, can you touch on some of your feelings and those early influences uh, in the way you started writing? Well, I, I think A. Merritt was the, That's the obvious. first major influence. <laughs> I read his short story, The People of the Pit, and then when I got a subscription to Amazing Stories, where it began with a 
the second installment of the moon pool and merit created for me a, a complete wonder world that was t total enchantment and my first stories were, were pretty merit-esque in many ways, <laughs> plot-wise and with my imitations of his vocabulary and then I admired the stories that Miles J. Brewer was writing. I induced him to take me on as a sort of apprentice and he was a good influence in, in making a more rational approach to writing a simpler style and better plotting, more emphasis on theme. And early on, I read, read the science fiction of H.G. Wells, and, and I feel Wells was a strong, corrective influence. And of course, I was reading the, the fiction in Grand Spikes magazines, and there was, was a sort of generalized influence there. I read Burroughs and I admired Burroughs' skill in plotting and storytelling. Telling so a story, he, yes. He may seem a little crude nowadays, but he, <laughs> he was a tremendously successful, gifted storyteller. Well, yes, even today his, his storytelling abilities comes through. His, mm -hmm. his writing ability, uh, per se, was not outstanding, but man, what a storyteller. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, I had a question that uh, I wanted to pop in there. Uh, that happens at my age and yours. Uh, I better release that one. <laughs> uh, once, once you got started, though, uh, you were like uh, a very good friend of yours, Ed Hamilton. You grew over a period of decades. Uh, some writers come in and they, they burn out very quickly. Uh, you managed to fit in and write the kind of things that people wanted decade after decade after decade with all kinds of changing styles and demands from the, from the reader. Uh, how did you go about that? Uh, I mean, was this a deliberate thing of trying to study the markets and uh, study the readers' columns and so forth, or was just a part of growth of just developing one thing on another? I, I, guess, I think it was more development than anything else. Of course, I, I was fascinated with science fiction. Uh, it was important to me. It was my life, really, and I, I re read the magazines and, and read, read books and it got into books and and I had good, good advice from editors occasionally and I, I kept trying to, to write soluble material. <laughs> well, of course. <laughs> I learned craftsmanship. I learned more science. I learned more about human nature. I gradually learned more about great literature, especially when I went back to school to, to get, get my degrees. And it's hard to, to be specific, but I don't think it, it hurt me to spend a few years studying and teaching great literature. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would say so, yes, because uh, <laughs> they, they were good and uh, there had to be a reason, and if you can follow in their foot tracks, you're doing very well. Uh, you, uh, you have memories of, uh, of any particular points in your career where you either tried to or did take deliberate steps to change the course of your career? Well. One thing that occurs to me about 
1941 or whenever, I was, well, I was working on the, the st story that J Jim Gunn helped me rewrite into Starbridge. And I was having difficulties with it, and John Camel suggested that he had, using the influence of C.S. Scoggins, and taken a new, new name and invented a new style for himself, a new personality, and suggested that I do the same sort of thing. And I happen to be a, a fan of C.S. Scoggins, who's writing wonderful st stories about the, the American Indian cultures and, mm -hmm. and, and, and Mardi Stahl and uh, uh, borrowed some of my name to call myself Will Stewart and, and made, well, let's say tried to pay more attention to, to st style and ca character. I don't think there's all that great a change, but I wrote the stories, the CC stories, the antibody stories that yeah. come about, and they got into print. That was, let's say, one small step. And yes. Of course, when I got back from the Army, why, the, the whole world had changed as a result of the atomic bomb and the war. And mm. I wrote the, the, the folded hands and then a sequel to it that became the humanoids. And that, of course, re reflects the military experience and re reflects the, uh, the mushroom cloud and whatever. And I'm not sh sure about the, uh, the ch change in st style of writing, but uh, I was trying to, I've been trying to learn how to write for, ever since I s started trying to <laughs> learn how to write, and I'm st still learning. I try to be res receptive to new ideas. I, I re read things. And, Try to see how they're working. These days, I have an interest in courtroom dramas and, mm. and good mystery stories, st stories that have a, a definite dramatic problem and, and believable ca characters and a well, well constructed plot. I, I like to see how they work. I enjoy reading them, I enjoy s s seeing them. Uh, uh, writers at work. Over the years, there have been various writers that I admired very highly. For example, Bashir Hammett from uh, the Black Mask School. Mm -hmm. I used to reread the Maltese Falcon every six months just mm -hmm. to, to st 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 study the dra dramatic scenes. Mm -hmm. I can't remember all the names I went not know to call, but I was a f fan of Somerset Maugham for a while. I read and enjoyed his short stories especially. And Paul Gallico wrote some great, great st 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 stuff in, in his time. Another name I want to call, but I can't, so I'll hmm. skip it. What, uh, what have been the, the things that have pleased you most or disturbed you most about the, the way the science fiction field has changed over the years? Well, I try not to be disturbed. I, <laughs> I, I, what was sort of turned off by the, the new wave because I felt that the, the new wave 
exaggerated attitudes of pessimism and despair and generally I feel that our technological advances have created hazards to us all but we're not going to escape technology or do away with it and the best we can do is to approach the world with a sort of measured optimism and not, not total despair and uh, I had an ideological quarrel with the new wave though the new wave resulted in some greater consciousness or awareness of style and characterization and so forth and a good thing for the field and I was delighted with Neuromancer when I read that. It was a, it was a b beautiful piece of uh, writing. What, what it seemed to me Gibson was doing was t taking a typical s story of the, the Black Mask School and, and updating the, the technology, but there's a, the same grim social background. Mm -hmm. and of course, Hammett was a communist, and I never knew whether his, the needs of his story made him a communist or the, the hatred of capitalism dictated what he was writing, but in his social background, well, everybody except the honest cop was, was corrupt. The, the girl, the cops, the the rich man and mm -hmm. the quote, quote villain and, and his, his, his cop was just a little bit shady himself and, and Gibson <laughs> carried it too far. The whole world is, is gritty and ugly and he doesn't have any heroes really. But some of his people are not as bad as others mm -hmm. but I think Cyberpunk was just a phase for Gibson, and it's, it'll go on to other and probably better things. In, in spite of uh, uh, Hammett and uh, uh, some of his uh, peers, uh, you don't lean too strongly toward the anti-hero then? No. Uh, the, the pattern I like that best of all is a p pattern of the Bildung's Roman, the young person gr growing up to discover himself in a social role, which is a pattern of m most good juvenile fiction, but also the pattern of Joyce's portrait of a young artist as a young man. It's, it's a, a pattern that I've used again and again and sometimes I think I shouldn't it's easy to fall into and it gives me a, a strong sense of who my main character is and what his world is and, and I tend to do it again and again though so I often think it would probably be better to plunge into the middle of the story with he was already adult and his world already established. Yeah. You've uh, uh, done a fair amount of collaboration. Uh, some authors seem to have benefited a great deal from collaboration, uh, both in their in the collaboration and the, in their later work. Uh, You've collaborated with some pretty high power people in the field. Uh, what kind of pleasures, uh, disadvantages, and advantages have you found there? Well, m most of these collaborations re resulted from my search to pro problems, sol solutions to problems with stories. Mm -hmm. My first collaboration was with Dr. Miles J. Brewer whom I admired and he took me on as a sort of apprentice and I, I did the, nearly all the writing and he 
participated in the plotting and the amazing suggestions and so forth. We wrote a short story and then a novel to both the New Republic, mm -hmm. which were not great, but I learned what I was doing them and they, they were respectable in my time and place. I mentioned the novel Starbridge, that was a problem, a problem story, let's say, and I discussed it with Jim Gunn when, at the time when the field was changing r rapidly. Uh, Gold had just started the galaxy and Tony Boucher and McComas had started up in SF and I, felt that the world was running away from me. It was full of bright new writers, that new tricks I didn't know, and, and Jim Glenn was one of the bright new writers, and I was happy to, to work with him, and we replotted the story, and he wrote the final draft of it, and it is certainly a respectable novel, and the collaborations with Fred Pohl began when he was my agent, and I sent him a couple of different projects that I'd had problems with them with, and each one of them developed into a trilogy before <laughs> they were through. Great. The undersea stories came from a, a thing in which I was going to be the, the conquest of the best. The, the, colonization, exploitation of the sea floor. I had plotted it out and, and created, uh, imagined the technology and the set of characters and, and whatever, and got to page 112 and it died and sent it to Fred and we got three novels about it that mm. Jim Bain has just reprinted in one book. And, the uh, Star Child trilogy started in a similar way. I had written, written a pretty whole draft of something I call the Roof of Space that had good, good ideas in it, but and I'd written it to the end, but it, it just didn't quite seem a professional level and I showed it to Fred and he agreed to collaborate and, and he wrote a, a finished draft and improved it in all sorts of ways and then we did two sequels to that. He is one of the true professional yeah. writers. If he, he, I admire his, his style, his ability as editor, his sense of timing, his general science fictional competence. He's yeah. done nearly everything in the field and done it well. And it's a, a privilege to collaborate with him. Our most recent collaboration was The Singers of Time, which happened when he made the commencement talk at our school a few years ago. And I was reading Hawking's Brief History of Time. And we decided to write a novel set in Hawking's universe. And it, it, I, we discussed it. I worked on first draft materials, and Fred did nearly all the finished draft. And he may have done more work on it than I did. I don't know, but it's not a bad novel. I was uh, I was curious in looking back uh, through your career. Uh, the collaboration with Miles Brewer was fairly early on in your career. You'd been uh, writing for three or four years. Well, how started, did you meet him? I started with him. Well, I've been publishing only a year or so. He, he was publishing letters in the back of the book. Mm -hmm. you know, Amazing! I got his address out of that. I admired his work, work and, and I don't remember the details of the early correspondence, but somehow I persuaded him to, to collaborate. And we first collaborated on a short story 
the girl from Mars that Grimes Bike. We, I'd submitted to Grimes Bike before he left Amazing Stories, and he took it along with him and published it in a little giveaway booklet as a as a gift for subscribers. I remember that, yes. I think I have one of that, as a matter of fact. So, so you you made the initiate uh, you initiated the uh, yeah, the contact yeah. mm -hmm. yeah, because I, I was trying to learn to write and I felt that Brewer had some, something to teach me and I think he did. Mm -hmm. He was not a great writer, but he was very serious about his craftsmanship and what writing should be. The, uh, the story should have a theme. It should, have a reason for being, it should say something, and he had ideas about characterization and so forth. He was a very busy doctor, he didn't have all that much time, and maybe not a great deal of literary ability, but he wrote a, a novel of his own, Paradise and Iron, it's yes. a pretty respectable utopian novel. For, for those days, yes. Well, now you have here and elsewhere uh, given a lot of credit for other people helping or uh, you along and uh, that you've learned so much from other people and so forth. Have you ever taken anybody under your own wing and uh, as a sort of a semi-protege or uh, to help them well, along individually? Well, exactly. I, no. I taught, taught creative writing in college right. for, for, for years, and, but I haven't produced any stars. I guess my best experience of that, that sort was with the really writers of the f future. When Ed had Fred and Gene Wolfe and me as the staff on his is was what works out for the winners at Taos. Yes. Mm -hmm. Where we had people like Chris Rice and, J and, and Wesley Dean Smith and Marcia Sukup and, and Ray Aldridge and Bridget McKenna and Mary, Mary Ann Fitz. And his, couple of others remained I can't think of all of them I think of, of some you know. some of those people may become some of our future stars. I know yeah. Mar Martha well, Sukup for example is Chris the, Rice you know. is a, well there two, two or three of them have uh, been competitors for the he goes in nebulous right. and so Martha's so up yeah. and uh, um, well um, I don't want to wear you out, and we've been going here quite a spell, and I think we've uh, achieved at least a part of our original purpose here. I think we have managed to wangle out of you some stories uh, and incidents that uh, may not appear elsewhere. And Probably told you more than I know, at least. <laughs> well, I put it in a body that tries to... Thank you very much for taking the time out, because uh, there's so much going on here, and... Uh, I appreciate it, and I enjoy just being able to sit down and well, talk with you some more, Jack. Yeah, and nice I look forward to it every time. <laughs> well, I look back with the pleasure on PopCon. Uh, I had a wonderful time there. Yeah. Well, we all enjoy ourselves there. There's no question about that. The big nostalgia thing going on. Yep. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Jack.